Welcome to EP Daily. Today on the show, Dread 3D brings the judgment to theaters. I read Dread growing up as a teenager, and I just always thought that he was one of the cool comic book heroes. I know. Why are you shooting everything? It's first class. Jake Gyllenhaal plays a cop marked for death in End of Watch. Yeah, I just thought it was totally original, and I was fascinated by it. Michael Bean is surprised by some unexpected visitors in The Victim. The Victim is a little grindhouse movie that we made on a very low budget. We get in the octagon with Fight Factory. I think we'll draw them in with the people and the characters, and then we'll hook them with the fights. We join the revolution in the sonar. Plus, we roll out and transform for our review on the run of Transformers Fall of Cybertron. I'm your host, Victor Lucas, bringing you the latest in everything cool every single day. You can't have my teddy bear, but you can have the rundown. Here it is. Two of the biggest summer movies are already getting sequels. Universal Studios has announced follow-ups to The Bourne Legacy and Ted. No way, that's awesome. Directed by Family Guy creator Seth MacFarlane, Ted follows the story of a vulgar talking teddy bear and his best friend, played by Mark Wahlberg. MacFarlane provides the voice of the title character. Ted is, he's that classic, big-hearted, but kind of meat-headed New England guy who has a lot of love and a lot of enthusiasm and zest for life, but no self-editing mechanism. Okay, all right, so that's where we'll draw the line. As for The Bourne Legacy, it's the fourth installment of the series and the first without Matt Damon. It focuses on a new agent played by the Avengers hero Jeremy Renner, and producer Frank Marshall has previously stated that he hopes Damon and Renner will join forces in future missions. You can learn more about Bourne and Ted by watching our behind-the-scenes stories on epdaily.tv. It's the most exciting development in the history of the science. Moviegoers will soon be able to descend into the radioactive world of Metro 2033. The Russian sci-fi novel has already served as the inspiration for two video games. Now, according to The Hollywood Reporter, MGM plans to turn it into a big screen movie. Metro 2033 takes place in Moscow after a devastating nuclear war and focuses on a group of survivors forced to live in the city's subway system. There are plenty of deadly mutants and enemy humans to make things interesting. Don't expect to see the movie for at least another few years. The second game in the franchise, Metro Last Light, is slated to emerge from darkness in early 2013. Here's a first look at what's sure to be one of this year's biggest Oscar contenders. Lincoln stars legendary thespian Daniel Day-Lewis as the famous American president and explores how he managed a team of former political rivals during the bloody Civil War. Blood's been spilled to afford us this moment now, now, now. The film is directed by Steven Spielberg, who has been planning to make a movie about Lincoln for decades. It'll march into theaters this November. Unlike another recent film, Abe Lincoln won't be hunting any vampires this time around. Shall we stop this bleeding? And another movie to watch out for come Oscar season is End of Watch. It's the gritty cop drama starring Jake Gyllenhaal and Michael Pena as a pair of LAPD officers who take on a ruthless drug cartel. Watch out for these guys. They operate by a different set of rules. The film premiered earlier this month at the Toronto International Film Festival and has been well received by critics. Training Day screenwriter David Ayer serves as director. If you want to go to a movie, you want to see some great action and the things we go to movies for, but at the same time, like the heart and performance and just that feeling of being friends with someone on a screen that you've never met before, I mean, that's what this experience is. We'll have more on End of Watch with David Ayer and the two leads later in the show. The film goes into wide release everywhere this Friday. Oh, really? You think? Ratchet & Clank creator Insomniac Games has finally unveiled its next project. Here's the first gameplay footage of Fuse, formerly known as Overstrike. Players are thrust into an elite paramilitary unit consisting of four members, and the gameplay is built with four-player co-op in mind. If your friends aren't available, you'll still be able to play by yourself, and you'll have the ability to leap back and forth between different characters and make use of their unique weapons. We'll have more on Fuse soon. The game will launch in March 2013. Rundown done, but here comes the fun with Scott Jones. Hey, Victor Lucas, remember doing? the old Sylvester Stallone movie where he's judge, jury, and executioner? That would be the 1995 film, Judge Dredd. I am the law. That's good. Well, they've done a remake in 3D with Carl Urban in the lead role, and Sean's got the lowdown. I am the law. That's enough out of you. Eight hundred million people living in the ruin of the old world. Only one 
thing fighting for order in the chaos. The men and women of the Hall of Justice. Carl, what was it about Dread that made you want to be a part of this project? Firstly, the people that were involved. It was a high caliber of uh, collaborators. Secondly, but probably more importantly for me, was the actual character of Dread himself. I read Dread growing up as a teenager, and I just always thought that he was one of the cool comic book heroes out there. He's dark, he's enigmatic, he's a rough justice kind of guy. And I guess his brand of heroism also appealed to me, the fact that he is a guy that is walking headlong into the face of danger. And it's always fun to do characters that are so far removed from what you like in real life. The sentence is death. What was it like acting with that helmet on and just having this part of your face visible? Yeah, well, that was always the challenge with this character, was how to communicate with the audience without the use of the eyes. The voice takes on supreme importance, as does the physicality of the character, you know, how you do what you do. It's a challenge. You've got a very limited bandwidth in which to play. What would you like people to feel coming away from watching the film? I would like them to feel entertained. Ultimately, that's why we make a movie. We shot that in Cape Town, and it was a lot of fun to do. I mean, it certainly had its challenges. For example, wearing that leather motorbike outfit with the body armor was about as comfortable as having an enema most days. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it was worth it in the end. I think that discomfort was probably some of the resulting attitude you see on Dread. I want him dead. The experience of making Dread was one of the most creatively rewarding experiences that I had. Our writer, Alex Garland, was on set the whole time. And for me, as an actor, that was a luxury. Whenever I would have a question about what was on the page, as I would turn to the guy who actually wrote it, from that standpoint, it was fantastic. I'm the law. Nice work, Sean. Now let's turn things over to Brianna, see what she's got for us. Bri? Thanks, Scott. I've got another exciting movie that's opening up this weekend. End of Watch stars Jake Gyllenhaal and Michael Pena as two LA cops taking on the cartel. And the director of the movie is best known for writing the screenplay for Training Day. Sean's got the goods on this one, too. Why are you shooting everything? It's for his class. I thought you were studying law. Free law. I need an R elected. I'm seeing filmmaking. David, you have written and directed End of Watch. Uh, you have a relationship with the LAPD. What made this story so important for you to tell? I wanted to nail the genre and just kind of walk away. <laughs> just put the cherry on top and, and be done with it. I've played in this arena before, but there's a lot of things I've left unsaid. And the big surprise in this movie is wait for it, is they're actually good guys. And I wanted to show the real side of policing, which is good dudes, that brotherhood, that friendship that partners have, guys who believe in the mission, they're getting the job done and doing it the right way. Follow me into the house, dude. I said you're not a detective. I want to be a detective. I understand that you read the script and you were immediately like, okay, I need to be in this, but what about the script immediately spoke to you? I think the style of the, the script itself and what I could see in terms of how Dave wrote the movie that he wanted to portray, that it was very clear he wanted it to be a point of view, sort of almost like a YouTube clip. He described the scenes and they f felt like you entered in the middle of a scene, you ended in the middle of the scene. There was never always a clear ending. It felt like it was already cut the way you see it in the movie on the screenplay. And I, I just thought it was totally original and I was fascinated by it. I, more than anything, the relationship between the two guys was what drew me to it. You know, I mean, we've seen this movie, a cop movie, cop genre movie, many, many times. But I don't think you've ever been inside a cop car with these two guys. I've never seen a movie like that before. There's a pattern, an MO here. When I read the script, it was captivating. And I didn't know why I liked the script right away. I actually had to read it a couple times. It's almost written like a play, in a way. And I haven't read anything like this. I haven't seen a movie like this in a long time, where it's like really about the brotherhood and it's about family, you know? And it's about real family. It's about like how people should be or wanna be. After the break, we pay a visit to Michael Bean's psychological thriller, The Victim, and we dig up some bones in the sonar. Later in the show, Jose goes toe-to-toe -to -toe with Fight Factory, and we give our review on the run of Transformers Fall of Cybertron. And you're back with EP Daily. If you like sex, murder, and serial killers, in other words, all the ingredients of those old Grindhouse movies, then you should check out a movie called The Victim. Here's Mary with a preview of the Blu-ray. The Victim is a horror movie that is on the not festival. It's not really a horror movie. It's not really a horror movie. No, it's All right, so I'm going to ask you. I'm going to let you tell me what it is. Okay. 
Michael, what is the victim? Uh, the victim is a little grindhouse movie that we made on a very low budget and I wrote it. So I'm just thinking, what do I put in this? I didn't really have enough money to do special effects. And so I looked at her and I asked her if she would get naked and do dirty things on film for me. And she said yes. And she asked her friend Daniel Harris. And I said, cool, I got the sex down. So then I'm going to do some dirty cops, drugs. I had enough money to do a little bit of action, a little bit of torture. And then I thought, yeah, f it, man, I'll just throw in a serial killer. Who do you play in The Victim? Um, I play her. <laughs> uh, cokehead stripper, party girl, does whatever she needs to do to get whatever she wants and has to pay a price for it. How can I resist playing a cokehead stripper? <laughs> Go get her. What do you hope fans get out of the movie? Just enjoy yourself. Laugh, lighten up, grab popcorn, grab your friends. Are you coming or not? Don't I always? So Jennifer, you're in the movie, you also produce the movie. Who do you play in the film? I play Annie in the film. She's kind of the heroine. She's sort of a controversial heroine. She's a stripper, but she's pretty likable. She's a stripper with a golden heart. There you yeah. go. <laughs> As an actor, to come into more of a production role, what were some of the challenges that you faced? We had three weeks of pre-production, and during that three weeks, I wrote the script. And then we rolled into a 12-day shoot. They're very short, we had one camera, and we were doing like 40 setups a day. So I'm very proud of the fact that it turned out as well as it did. The victim will show up in stores tomorrow, and there are a bunch of season finales to catch on TV this week, like Wilfred and the animated series Black Dynamite, not to mention the reality show Wipeout and Eric McCormack's psychic series Perception. But it's fall now, and that likely means you're more interested in the new and returning TV shows. So let's take a look at those. Revolution debuts tonight. The brand new series from J.J. Abrams and Supernatural's Eric Kripke follows a strong-willed young American woman as she sets out to discover why the country has been left without electricity and if it will ever return. Bones returns for its eighth season tonight. The Jeffersonian team must find a way to clear Brennan's name so she and her baby can come home. In last season's finale, she was framed for murder and forced to flee. Bones? Also hitting the airwaves tonight is a series premiere of The Mob Doctor, a fast-paced medical drama focusing on a young female surgeon caught between two worlds as she juggles her promising career with her family's debt to Chicago's Southside Mob. And this Thursday, NBC's Comedy Night, Done Right, All Night is back, beginning with a new season of Up All Night. When Regan and Ava find out their show has been canceled, their friendship is tested, and Chris decides to re-enter the working world. Season 9 of The Office premieres immediately after. Original showrunner Greg Daniels is back at the helm for this final hurrah. Yeah! In the first episode, we'll be introduced to two new characters who have been hired to take over for Kelly, who, as former customer service rep, left behind 4,000 unanswered customer complaints. You have the right to request judgment by combat. Dwight's rights. And after that, Parks and Rec premieres. We're back. Jeremy, suck it! In the season five starter, Leslie Nope and Andy head to Washington, D.C. to visit Ben in April and are starstruck at the sight of real senators. Then, following her return to Pawnee, Leslie struggles to balance work now that she's a city councilor and a member of the Parks Department. Let me ask you one question. Would you be cool doing things that a prostitute does? And nothing stays buried forever. Season 3 of the Stephen King-inspired sci-fi series Haven premieres on Friday and brings even more supernatural events to the small town in Maine. And the New Orleans drama Dream, which has been off the air for over a year, returns with 10 new episodes beginning this Sunday. The first is titled Knock With Me, Rock With Me and was co-written by food author Anthony Bourdain. Still to come, Jose takes on Fight Factory and we give our review of Transformers Fall of Cybertron. Welcome back to EP Daily. Believe it or not, there's a darker and grittier side to mixed martial arts fighting, and that's the subject of a new TV show called Fight Factory. Our own heavyweight champion, Jose Sanchez, has an early look. Javier, first off, I have to say, this gym is absolutely amazing. How great does it feel for you to have something like Fight Factory come? The reality show is going to show what it is like to be behind a top 
camp and the struggles that they go through, the hardships, the happiness, the sadness, I think it's going to show what real life's all about behind a top camp in the MMA world. How do you guys pull in the fight talent that you guys have here? Because the roster of amazing caliber fighters is pretty intense. The majority of the talent has been uh, recruited by my partner, Dwayne Zinkin. He's a wrestler from the wrestling community, and most of the guys here come from a wrestling background. My brothers were wrestlers. We all wrestled at Fresno State. We believed that wrestling was a great martial art, and there was finally a place for a wrestler to go, a professional sport where a wrestler can hopefully try to make a living. How hard do you guys have to train to be at the best and the tip-top of shape where you need to be to knock people out? Man, you gotta train hard. Three sessions a day usually, uh, five days a week, and then a session on Saturday as well. It's weird having a reality show filming while you're training, but yeah, I think it'll come out really good. I think we'll draw them in with the people and the characters in the show, and then we'll hook them with the fights. When you're not surviving bloodbaths against other guys, how do you get yourself mentally prepared for something like Fight Factory? It's easy. I mean, you come in every day in training. I mean, the guys who are coming in and filming, I mean, pretty much like a flies on the wall. They actually capture what we do every day, training, when we're off training. You guys don't ever try to go for the little extra oomph when the cameras are rolling? You don't want to, like, embarrass the guy a little bit? Nah, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> just, uh, just every day, like I said, we lay it on the line, work hard, and pretty much it shows. Having the show, it can't be a distraction from what we got to do, which is win fights. Our job is to get all these guys out there and get them winning. Top, top, ground, go, 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 damage, damage, damage. The number one thing that was negotiated is that the cameras are never in the way of training. When it's time to fight, it's playtime. It's time to go out and have a good time because you've done all the hard stuff. And speaking of fight factories, let's continue that age-old battle of Autobots versus Decepticons. If you've been wondering if the new Transformers video game Fall of Cybertron is worth playing, we've got the answer. Ben and Jose are here with a review, so roll out. Well, it's your favorite two bags of flesh today, and I know what you're thinking. Bags of flesh, that's disgusting, but as it turns out, Jose and I, we're more than meets the eye. <laughs> Nice, you did it right when I was roboting. We're actually taking a look at Transformers Fall of Cybertron today. That's right, this is the big escape from Cybertron. The Autobots, they're getting out of there. Right at the beginning, they tell you Cybertron is basically having a lot of trouble. It's got battery problems. The world is blowing up because the Decepticons are just, they trashed everything with this giant war with the Autobots. And now the Autobots want to get away. They want to find a new planet, but the Decepticons, they're not okay with that. They want to kill them. I will tear your ship apart piece by piece. These Transformers look incredible. Optimus Prime's got these little pistons that kind of move back and forth. They're all animated. They look better than they've ever looked. You actually get to play as both sides. You play some Autobots, you play some Decepticons in the single player game, but I thought the story kind of went all over the place. I, I couldn't really follow it, and often it was really just one guy. I, I love the beginning, you're controlling Optimus Prime, which is yeah. awesome right off the bat, but I never really understood what the hell I was doing. I was kind of just running around, like changing batteries. Now, you can actually fight against death by upgrading some of your weapons, which is new to the game. I'm glad they threw it in here because it, it is sort of an extra layer of depth that they didn't have in the last game. Sure. Now, the campaign's also a little short. Yeah. Doesn't take you too long. It's only about 10 missions or so. Yeah, and but this game has a lot of focus on the multiplayer. I mean, this, sure. that's what people want to jump in. They want to play as Autobots versus Decepticons, go in there and battle each other out. I think the only thing is, none of it felt that much different from the last game. I feel like I had a similar multiplayer experience. I feel like I had a similar single player experience. I like that they upped the level of carnage in general, yeah. but I still sort of feel like they're kind of repeating things they did. Jose, transform into some sort of score for me. I'm giving it an eight out of 10. I'm giving it a 7.5. On the next EP Daily, we continue our look at the new thriller, End of Watch. We find out the perks of being a wallflower. You're a wallflower. And coming soon to EP, we pay a visit to the house at the end of the street. Welcome back to EP Daily. The first person shooter Borderlands 2 is in stores in less than 24 hours. Excited? We know how you feel. Here's Brianna with one last look at the game before it rocks your world. I hear you're considering an excursion to the Borderlands. Well, let me be the first to warn you that Pandora has changed. It's not long before you'll be able to shoot and loot in Borderlands 2. The game is nearing release, and many people are very excited about the game. So 
Where does it take place in terms of storyline and how does it relate to the first game? I see. So Borderlands 2 picks up uh, a few years after the, the ending of the first game. So spoiler alert, the Vault Hunters go to the vault, they open it, they succeed, and there's a huge monster that spills out and you learn at the beginning of Borderlands 2 that actually caused the planet itself to change. It started spewing iridium, a very powerful substance that's attracted the attention of Hyperion Corporation. So we pick up with the leader of the Hyperion Corporation, Handsome Jack, and he's on a quest to find more vaults that may be on Pandora. What are the four classes that will be in the game? We have Zero, our assassin. He's a very stealthy sniper. We have the Gunzerker, Salvador. You know, he can just jump in, guns blazing, wielding two weapons at once, which is a hell of a lot of fun. We have Maya, our new siren. Her ability is phase lock, trap the enemy in a bubble, and you can do all sorts of fun things with that. And finally, last but not least, we have Axon, our new commando, and his turret is just awesome. How is the gameplay different this time around, or what have you done to improve it? Oh, the guns, of course. 17 million in the first game, scrapped them all for this game. Everything you'll see, still millions and millions and millions of guns, brand new. We were able to work out some of the kinks in the user interface and the feel of the guns. Our main menu now functions as a lobby as well. When you launch the game, it'll connect to your friends list, and you can see everybody else who's playing Borderlands 2, what mission they're on. It's still drop-in, drop-out co-op. We score split-screen online connectivity as well, so we've tried to make it easier for players to connect with each other. If you missed anything in the show or you just want to watch it again, you can visit us at g4tv.ca or go to our website at epdaily.tv. You can also find us on Facebook under Electric Playground and follow us on Twitter at epdailytv. Hey, you can also check out our podcast at VixBasement.com. You can also download our mobile app for your iOS and Android devices. And while you're on our website, make sure you take a look at Scott's preview of Joe Danger 2. Thanks for watching, everybody. See you next time. In this one, you've been discovered by this Hollywood director, and he's making the world's greatest action film. And that changes everything in Joe's world. So he's a stuntman on this amazing film with unlimited budget, and he's making use of that. So he's on skis and skidoo and jetpacks. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah.